Hello and welcome to Anatomy of Us, a show dedicated to bringing real help to real couples. I'm your host, Melanie Studley. What's up, guys? My name is Seth Studley. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and together we are high-performance marriage coaches. We are cutting through the bullcrap and creating a movement of happy, healthy, badass couples all over the world. Let's go! Hey, guys, what's up? Today, we interviewed Ryan Mickler, the founder and host of Order of Man podcast, I've listened to that show for about five years. It's been amazing. And we had the chance to sit down with him and we talk about God and alcohol. That's right. God and alcohol. Hmm. Okay. Uh, They don't go together really, but they do affect a lot of people. And this was a really, really cool conversation. And I'm looking forward to uh, your guys' questions and follow up if you have them Mm -hmm. after that. Yeah. In this episode, I have to do a little caveat here. By little, I mean large. Uh, We sat down and recorded this. It was awesome possum. And then mm. our files actually, like, were, what is the word called? They were corrupted. The and devil. never, ever, ever have had files get corrupted ever, mm. ever. And so we lost our entire video. So you so could have been watching this, but you, now you cannot. Somebody was trying to steal our joy. <laughs> but nope, we ain't going to get down. We ain't, we, ain't, we ain't having that. So audio only. This show is amazing. Ryan is a super cool dude. Yeah. Uh, if you don't follow Order of Man stuff, go and follow it right now. Enjoy the show. All right. Obviously, hey. we both got the man flannel overcoat uh, memo this morning. So right. I see that. That's that's going. See that. My dreams are coming true. Yeah, I guess is so. all I need in my day. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> yeah, man. So uh, yeah, we're just gonna dive right in. So it's yeah. it's good to talk to you again. Thank you for saying yes so quickly. Uh, <clears throat> just reach out on Instagram. You're like, yep, let's do it. And you've been talking about a couple of things that have really been on my heart lately. And I, I and so. I usually we have notes and like copious notes for interviews and stuff like most podcasters do. But this time it's like, okay, totally winging it. And we're going to talk about two things. And of course, if you want to talk about other stuff, but God and alcohol. And that's kind of okay. like the, the catchphrase, I think, mm-hmm. um, that is going to resonate with a lot of men, especially um, who have either been hurt by the church, who are like, yeah, God, I don't know, church, the bunch of churchgoers look like wusses and pansies anyway, so that's not for me. <laughs> But you've been talking about this recently on some of your stuff, and I've been thinking deeply, like really deeply about this stuff just in the last, I would say, month. And uh, a lot of things are changing for us and like what we want to do moving forward, which is super cool. And when you posted stuff, number one, about the, the alcohol post, and mm-hmm. then your, your latest interview, well, one of your latest interviews with Granger, like talking about God and, and stuff is like, man. I think there's I think there's something here, and it it feels like uh, like a lot of dudes that I talk to. I'm not sure about you. It's like either either struggle with God or struggle with alcohol, among other or things, or both, but, or both. And those are just such yeah. such honestly two powerful forces. God is stronger than alcohol, obviously, but it's a lot of stuff that we're going through. Um, so, but sorry about that. First of all, will you introduce yourself to guys who don't know you? Ryan, somebody uh, who I've followed for a long minute. So, uh, but go ahead and introduce yourself, man. What, who are you? What you're about? Yeah. So I'm, I'm Ryan Mickler. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I've got four incredible kids, three boys and a girl. Uh, my wife and I and children live here in Maine. We've got a, a property here that we bought about three and a half years ago and um, have been doing a lot of renovating and building and things like that for our organization, which is called Order of Man. So that's a, a an organization or a movement that's focused on giving men the tools and resources they need to thrive as men, mm-hmm. however they show up, whether that's a father or a husband, a community leader, a, a owner of a business or employee, coach, mentor, friend, whatever, however men are showing up, we want to give them the resources they need to thrive. Right on. And you're doing it too. I, I mean, you, let's see, how, old's the, how old is Order of Man? About six, seven years old now? Seven and a half. Yeah. Seven and a half years. We started in March of 2015. Whoa. So we're coming up on eight years now. That feels like a million years ago, 2015. Yeah. Like who even yeah, remembers that It seems like it's so long. Yeah. It seems like it's so long ago, but then I think about when we started it, you know, I started the podcast in a, in a spare bedroom of our basement in our home and that doesn't actually seem that long ago. But then when you think about eight years, it's like, whoa, Right, almost a decade has gone by, and I've been doing this for that long. It's yeah. wild to think about. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's crazy. Uh, you guys go check out Order of Man. It's been very influential in my life, and just like other resources and interviews that you've done. So, 
Thanks. One of my First favorite of things Thank I have you. to say, one of my favorite things is if I know someone knows who you are, I know they're a good person. <laughs> I'm like, oh, you know who Ryan McClure? Like, we're good. <laughs> like, like well, we're in the same. That's really nice. I don't, <laughs> I, I don't feel like, I, I know you're complimenting me, I think, like, but you I don't feel it. like that because I know my own weaknesses. And I think some of the people that maybe listen and tune into what we're doing are, are better men than I. So mm-hmm. well, thank I, you. It, I appreciate yeah. that, that compliment. Absolutely. Well, I just listened when I, okay. I listened to the, was his name Granger mm-hmm. that episode. And yeah. you talked about being sort of like walking through this with people in real time. And that I think is so, that's what sets you apart is that you're, you're like letting people into the process you're saying, this is what I'm going through right now. It's not the like buttoned up thing. I have it all figured out. Here's my 10 steps. You know what I mean? And that's part of yeah. what I like about it. I'm glad. I, I hope I've never come across as, as somebody who, who presents himself as the epitome of masculinity, or if there was a, a definition uh, of masculinity, there would be a picture of, <laughs> of, of me right by it. Like that, that's just not the case. Um, I'm so flawed and I struggle in so many ways and I, I have ups and downs. And I think some of the downs are, are what we actually are going to talk about mm-hmm. today, which I'm both grateful for the opportunity to talk about it and also not looking forward to talking about it. But this is why we need to have these conversations. Right. Yeah. It's, I, I tell my clients and the guys I talk to all the time, growth always happens in the uncomfortableness, right? There, there is no growth without being out of your comfort zone, without feeling like, oh shit, this hurts. I don't want to talk about this. Mm-hmm. But that's where the growth comes from. I mean, like, all the growth in our marriage mm-hmm. literally happened from Melanie giving me a black eye years ago. That's why we have the podcast. That's why we do the men's groups, the women's groups, the coaching. That is the reason why we do mm-hmm. all this. Now, looking back, it's like, hey, do you want to get punched in the face by your wife and go through hell for two and a half years? Uh, no, thanks to that. But seeing it on the other side, I'm like, yeah, I wouldn't trade that experience for anything because it has produced so much growth, so much like closeness, so much like just produced a lot, you know, right. just like anything working out, saving. It's like, you got to put in the time and effort. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. With um, that. So I would love to know, tell us, just give us a backstory of your journey with like the drinking and all of that stuff, like dive in where you want to dive in. Yeah. Um, I started drinking probably, I want to say maybe had my first drink when I was like 13 or 14, maybe somewhere in there. Mm-hmm. Didn't really become an issue until I was maybe 16 or 17. I would, you know, get drunk after the games. I was always an athlete, always did well in school, but um, yeah, I love getting drunk after, after games or on the weekends with my buddies. And that's what we do. We, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how we had alcohol. I really, I'm <laughs> yeah. looking back on it now. I'm like, how did we even like, did we steal it from our parents? I mean, my parents didn't drink, so it wasn't from my parents. I don't know. I don't know how we had it, but we had it in droves mm-hmm. and we always got drunk. Um, and then, yeah, out of high school, a lot of drinking, a lot of partying. Uh, I, I completed half a semester of college, uh, realized I hated doing that. I was in the military. Uh, and, and then I, I remember one evening I was drunk. It was getting so bad that I would come home from work. I was in retail management at the time. I'd come home from work and my roommates would be gone or out or whatever. And I would still by myself drink, you know, a six pack of beer Mm -hmm after work for no reason. Mm -hmm. Why? I don't. And I realized that. Why am I, why am I drinking? I'm not doing it to be fun. I'm not doing it as a social thing. What in the world is going on? And so I kind of continued down that path for a while. And um, yeah, I was, I I was drunk and I just, I just remember thinking this is ridiculous, like just a ridiculous thing to be doing. And I stopped. Um, And not long after I met my wife and I don't, I don't think that was just a coincidence. Uh, when you chart, start to change your life for the better, things happen. Mm-hmm. It's not coincidental. Absolutely. Uh, and then, and then, really, I I stopped drinking for like twenty years, eighteen, nineteen years, somewhere right in there. And a couple of years ago, um, you know, I had I had a drink here or there, and then that that drink turned into, well, now I have a drink every night, and then it was a couple drinks every night, mm-hmm. and then it was like, okay, I'll have a drink in the afternoon. I don't have any podcasts or anything going on. I'll have a drink this afternoon. And then I started drinking whiskey and it was like, all right, I'll have a shot now. I'll have a shot later. And then I'm, it got so bad within a period of about a year and a half to two years where there wasn't much time during the day that I wasn't either drunk or getting over being drunk or passed out. Mm -hmm. I mean, from sun up till sundown. And 
yeah, it got really bad, you know, bad between my wife and I, bad between the way that I was showing up for the kids. And I was delusional. Mm -hmm. I mean, absolutely delusional. I was so complacent. And looking back on it now, I've been sober for a little over four months. No, excuse me, a little over about 110, 115 days. So just about four months. Mm -hmm. And looking back on it now, I mean, I can't, I can't even believe the guy that I was becoming. And this from a guy who tells other men how to be better men. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize it was as bad as it was. I thought I had a handle on it, but I can't tell you how many times I thought to myself, you know, I was drunk and I would think this is it. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm going to get help. I knew I needed help. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to, I'm going to do a pot. I'm just going to do a podcast and come clean and that'll be a way I'm going to just uh, confront it. And then I would sober up and I would just chicken out mm -hmm. or I would tell myself, yeah, well, you may have a problem, but it's not that bad because, you know, you've got your family, you're, you're, you've got the relationship, you've got the kids, you've got the business, you're making money. People think highly of you. It, it, I just, I, I guess I convinced myself that I was a quote, high functioning alcoholic and mm -hmm. it wasn't a real problem. Um, and yeah, through some conversations with my wife that were not comfortable, mm. very difficult, heartbreaking, heart wrenching conversations for me and for her, I'm sure too. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, we, we knew a change had to be made and, um, I've got, you know, my, my little street street counters right here, my calendars of, of, you know, days without a drink. So yeah. it's been good, you know, it's been good and hard. Yeah. It's hard to confront what I used to hide through alcohol yeah absolutely yeah. well first i want to say congratulations on a hundred and something days sober thank That's you rad like thank it's you amazing so rad i have like 800 questions um but the first question i want to ask is i would love to know like how your wife started talking to you about this or was did you feel convicted and talk to her first or just give like paint us a picture of what that looked like behind the scenes from a marital perspective because I know a bunch of listeners are either going to feel like I need to talk to my wife about this or my husband about this or vice versa. Um, so I'd love to know just like, yeah. what it like. I, I'm trying to, I'm not trying to manufacture our conversations. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to do it in a way that's, that, that is truthful, but, but respects her and the way that she approached me on it as well. So I just have to think about that a little bit. Um, I, I will tell you that, and, and I'll, I'll answer that question. I will tell you that I did have friends that I, I came clean to about this. Um, I, I was a closet drinker. I didn't want anybody to know because I thought they would think less favorably of me. So it was like an image that I was trying to portray. Mm -hmm. uh, and I told, a, I told a handful of people that are close friends of mine. And a couple of them said, yeah, I, I knew, I know that you're an alcoholic. Mm. I'm like, what? No, yeah, I knew. I could smell it on your breath or, you know, the way you're behaving. I knew. I was like, man, why didn't you tell me? You mm -hmm. know, it was like, why? And that's more rhetorical. But, but the more I think about it, the more I, I really question why. Why didn't you tell me? Maybe it was the way I would have responded. Uh, maybe you didn't feel like we were close enough. Maybe you were afraid of, of something, the backlash. I don't know, but I wish they would have. I really do. And I also wish that my wife would have been more forthcoming with it. I think it would have been very challenging, especially in the depths of, of my alcoholism. Um, I, I wish it would have happened sooner. I wish that she would have been in my face a little bit more. Uh, I think she probably would say that she was, mm -hmm. and I would probably say that she wasn't. So there was a disconnect there, mm -hmm. you know, between the way that she viewed it and the way that I saw her communicating her problem about it with me. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I don't really know how to answer that directly. I, I, we had some very, very uncomfortable and difficult conversations um, that finally got me to the point where I realized, okay, there's a lot at risk here. Yeah, I'll put it that way. Yeah, there's a lot at risk here. So, what was she communicating, and how were you interpreting it when she was saying things to you? Yeah, I think just in the conversations that we had, I, I think she was saying things like, hey, Ryan, you know, I'm, I'm concerned. I'm concerned about you. Mm -hmm. um, or, hey, you know, your dad had a problem with this, which was very true. Your dad had a problem and I'm concerned, like maybe you should scale back. These types of things where she expressed her concern and I didn't interpret it as I have a problem with this. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're not treating us correctly. You're not treating us well. Mm -hmm. 
I interpret it as she loves me. She cares about me. She wants what's best for me, but I'm okay. I got a handle on this. Right. Thing. Like she doesn't need to be concerned. I see. And I think what she was saying now was, yes, I'm concerned about you, but also you're not treating us the way you should be treating us mm -hmm. as her husband and the father of our children. Right. So is that what you wish she had just said? Like straight up? Because I can see how you could feel like if someone said, I'm concerned about you, it almost feels like I'm thinking about you. Like that's like, okay, you're yeah. thinking about me. Mm -hmm. So do you wish that she had straight up been like, hey, you're not doing right. Like you're not treating us. So like give us the words for that in case someone else is walking through this journey. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a, I, I think that's a, a general difference between men and women. So that, that can prove to be challenging. You know, men are more just uh, confrontational by nature. And I think if there's an issue, we're more willing generally to come out and say, here's the problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think women are, are communicating the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they, they might interpret something as, well, no, I did tell you. And it's like, well, no, you didn't, right. you know? So I don't think that she wasn't telling me. Right. I think she's telling me the truth. But yes, I do wish that not only her, but even my friends, like I mentioned a minute yeah. ago, would have been more forthright with it and said, hey, here's the problem. Mm -hmm. Here's what's at risk. And here's how you're going to treat yourself and treat us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, I, I again, I'm only asking over and over again to give people words who are either in this position with their spouse or, you know, their friend or whatever, because that's, I think mm -hmm. the hardest part is that we have no roadmap for these things. We don't know how to say like, hey, I see that there's a problem going on and I don't think you feel good about this. Like we just don't have a guide for those things, you know? Yeah. And, and I, and I try to, you know, if I were to put myself in my wife's shoes or, or another woman's shoes who might need to have a conversation with her husband about this, mm -hmm. I, I, I get why she wouldn't, I get why a, a, a woman wouldn't do that. Um, especially as I know so many men deal with alcohol and they become aggressive. They become, you know, in, in some cases physical, which I, mm -hmm. you know, never did, mm -hmm. but, uh, but it's scary, you know, it really is. And there's a risk associated with that. Well, you know what? There's a risk associated with not bringing it up right. too. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think the risk, especially when you, um, commit to somebody through marriage, the risk is a requirement mm -hmm. through the vows that we made mm -hmm. to each other. Well yeah, hundred percent. Now I, I want to thank you for, for talking about that and being open. And I want to talk about like the piece where it's like, okay, like guys, especially like high achieving guys who actually give a damn about stuff. We look up to certain people, you know, whether that's a political leader. I mean, I guess there's not many of those to look up to <laughs> these days, but, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, podcasters, like people in the space doing cool stuff. And there, there's always a risk of like, and I remember, cause I did this with a pastor a long time ago. I was like, oh, that dude has it together. Um, he can speak, you know, his family looks great, all this stuff. But eventually like his whole life fell apart. And I was like, wow, that I was really naive to like look up to this guy in that way. But I think all of us kind of want somebody to look up to in that way. So like being a person who has a platform, obviously we, we both do, but being, I don't, I don't want to, I'm not going to use the word vulnerable in that, but like, uh, open and say, Hey, I'm going to risk this. Uh, I don't know. I might lose some listeners or coaching clients or whoever, but it's like, I can't, I can't not talk about this and still move forward in a way that I need to move forward. Right. So like with you, with you sharing your story, was there like a, um, a, a part where you're like, Oh man, if I do this, like, I mean, I started this whole thing. What, what, what then? Like what, what may the repercussions be after that? What kind of thoughts did you have around that? Yeah. I mean, that was a very real concern. That's my income. That's our family's income, you know, but ultimately it came down to doing the right thing and doing the right thing isn't contingent upon the outcome. Mm. And so I, I had to separate the outcome. Hey, you know, yes, this could be bad. It could be really bad mm -hmm. from the optics, from the, it could be that. So yeah. what? You know, you need to be in integrity. You need to share this because if you've been dealing with it, you know, other people are dealing with it. Mm -hmm. And so it's crucial that you share it because you might be able to use some of your past 
problems uh, and, and current problems. You know, this is something that it's not, I'm not so naive to believe that this will never rear its ugly head again. Mm-hmm. Like this is something I actively and aggressively have to combat. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I, I think that my pain can be used to help other people, but I also think it can be healing for me mm-hmm. to yeah. be able to talk about these things. But, you know, on the other side of it too, where you talk about a pastor, um, you know, we've all placed other men on pedestals. And I thought to myself, you know, people are going to think I'm a hypocrite. You know, here I am talking about all these things to make us better as men. Am I being hypocritical? And I mean, we can argue about the semantics and we can look over the verbiage, but I'll tell you why I'm okay with it. Because everything that I've shared is true. I just had a problem following my own advice in some aspects of my life. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make what I shared any less relevant or true or helpful if somebody actually applies it. I just found it challenging to apply it in my own life in some ways. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to bridge that gap. I'm trying to make those, make those corrections. And I think that's what we need to be careful of is placing people on pedestals and try to differentiate between the person and the message. Mm Because people can be flawed and they can still share the information. Mm-hmm. But if we hold them in such a high regard that we think they're flawless, that's where we're going to be let down. And that's where we might actually take good advice and blow it up because that bad person shared it. Mm. It's like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Right. Yeah. Well said. Take the message for what it's worth and realize all of us are flawed. Yeah. We all have struggles. Mm-hmm. It doesn't make the message less relevant. Absolutely. I love it. Uh, I would love to know what the first, well, two things. The first one is, I would love to know your thoughts. Like what went through your head when you realized like, oh wait, I've got to deal with this. Like I, I just kind of want to know the internal monologue that went through your head so that other men can, or women can, feel that process with you. Does that make sense? Because oftentimes that's the thing that people don't share. They'd share like, oh, and I joined this group and I did this thing because I want to know what steps you took to get better. But I also want to know how it felt and what you thought. So if you could share that, that'd be helpful, I think. Yeah, I wish I could tell you that one day I woke up and decided I needed to get the help I needed and it was all on my own and I had the strength to do it and I came to the conclusion on my own. That would have been way, that would have been a way better story. It, it would have painted me in a better picture mm-hmm. for sure. That's not what happened. Mm-hmm. It was the conversations that I had with my wife and the the realization that I had real things to lose, like her and my children. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. That That's what woke me up. And the minute I felt that, because there was always this underlying, not always, but for, for many, many months leading up to this, there was that underlying thought of, I need help. I need to deal with this. And talking myself out of it, like I mentioned earlier. But when we had those conversations, it got real very quickly Mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, the first thing I did is, okay, like I I was, at first I did it because for her and the kids, Mm -hmm. like, okay, like clearly this is not working. I don't want to lose you guys. Like I, like, let me, let me do these things. And I jumped on and I found an AA meeting and I uh, found a therapist that I could talk with. Uh, actually, I called a few therapists in my area and they said they had a three or four week or two month waiting period right. or something, you know, and I said, well, I can't, you know, that's two months away. Yeah. Like it's too long. Mm-hmm. So I jumped online and I looked for online therapy and and found a, an organization called BetterHelp yeah. that, oh, yeah. I, that I actually started working with them. Um, you know, worked with a couple different therapists uh, to to varying degrees of success or or compatibility, maybe is the better way to say it. Um, but yeah, I've been going to my AA meetings for, like I said, the past three, four months. And yes, yeah, still doing it for my wife and kids, but I realized that it's more important that I do it for myself, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that I get right with myself because the externals will align and take care of themselves if I take care of the things that are within my control, Mm -hmm. which is not my wife. It's not completely my children. Mm -hmm. It's my own actions, my own behavior. Yeah. Cause you, you live with yourself, right? (laughs) Uh, you can only control yourself. And I give this analogy 
all the time, you know, when you're on an airplane, what do they say? Put your air mask on first, you know, because right. I am no use. And the instinct is like, put it on Melanie or put it on the kids if they can't do it. But sure, okay, now the kids have the air, the oxygen mask on and I'm passed out in the middle of the aisle. Mm -hmm. Then I'm, I'm toast. You know what I'm saying? So you have to take care of yourself first. And like, you have to be right. You know, the metaphor, like all of us have to be right to have right relationships, in my opinion, like as a therapist and as a coach. And like, I just well, want to- Can I say one other thing yeah. about the, about basing your decisions on externals, basing positive or negative decisions on externals, like a marriage, for example. Well, she can leave anytime. Like she can still leave. So if she does, or if she did, so what do I, because it didn't work, do I go back to my old behavior? Yeah. If I was doing it for that external, right. the answer is yes. A hundred percent. I'd go right back to drinking. Right. But I don't want to live that life, whether it's with her or not, or mm -hmm. any in this business or not. I don't want to live that mm -hmm. life. It's separate from the external factors. It's an internal decision I'm making now. Mm -hmm. I love that. It makes me think of, so when we work with clients and there's a similar situation going on, sometimes the wife will actually be frustrated because the husband will say, I'm doing this for you. And she'll want the husband to say, I'm doing this because I know I need to, and I know whatever. And so I want to get your opinion on that because at first, so in the beginning, was it like you said, like, I'm doing this to save my marriage and my relationship with my kids. And then did it sort of transform the longer you're sober? Has it changed to be like, oh, wait, this is also for me? Or was it always like, no, this is for me and for the kids? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think, I think um, it was probably always for me mm -hmm. to a degree mm -hmm. But it became more and more about doing it for the right reason, which was for myself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. over time, mm -hmm. because I began to realize that you can't control other people. And it's not like I didn't know that. It's right. just you, you, you see it, right? And so you have to stay the course regardless of the, if, if the relationship is, is going well or not. I can certainly understand a woman's point of view when she says, no, I want this. I want you to do it for you. Mm -hmm. I, I just wish there was a magical box that would take our verbiage yeah. as men yeah. and translate it mm -hmm. through the woman's mm -hmm. perspective. And she could hear like what our intent is yeah. and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Right. There isn't. And so I would say to a woman, when a man says, I'm doing this for you and you're thinking, well, it's frustrating. I want to do it for yourself. Just know that when he says that, or at least when I've said that mm -hmm. it's, because I love you, right? Because you're worth it, because you're important to me, because you're special. Like it's a compliment to you. Mm -hmm. And I realize that you want us to do it for the right reasons, but also take that phrase, I'm doing this for you, for what it's worth, which is you are important, you are special, mm -hmm. you are worth changing for. Yeah. And I love you. Yeah. yeah. Well said. That's so well said. And I think. I wish that more people understood. I always now am like, I won't understand what Seth says to me, but I can, I've known him long enough and we've done this podcast long enough for me to be able to infer what he means, which is a huge gift to be like, no, straight out of the gate, I'm going to misunderstand it. But if I know him well enough, love him well enough, I'll, I'll know what he means, even though right out of the gate, I'm like, what did you just say? That doesn't make any sense. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. But there's just so much, I just have seen so many wives accidentally, um, like kind of knock the knock their husbands off of their progress because of they've they've been like disappointed like well you're only doing this for me like what the hell is a better person to do it for what do you mean right. that's a great thing it's yeah. a great thing to do this for your wife or for your husband or whatever so don't don't like diminish the importance of that so I, that was yeah it's like oh I'm doing this to get you to shut up okay well that feels crappy right, right. like I'm doing this so same, you won't yeah. nag me you know anymore and just be like lay off woman you know kind of thing it's not that that is not a good it's husband's yeah intent it's like I'm doing this for you because I care enough I see the mm -hmm. value and I want to respect that and honor that and cherish that and be like yeah you are set apart and mm -hmm. you being set apart and all that you are is a big enough reason for me to really look at all the stuff that I'm doing mm -hmm. and change for you. Right. And then of course, in turn, change for myself. Right. In therapy, we, we call that a first or second order change. A first order change is just like, okay, fine, I'll do it for you. So you won't bug me. Like, right. how long does that last? Like three weeks, right? But the second order right. change is what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our successful clients do 
is when like, oh, wait a minute, I see the long-term value in this, like take accountability, ownership for all this stuff, and then do the things and set things in place to maintain that change. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, that's it's the second order change. That one lasts. Have you ever heard of the power of going second? Are you familiar with that? Uh, no, I'm not. I don't I, think so. I, maybe, Did I don't you know. make it up? No, you always no, talk about I didn't, it. I, don't I didn't make this up. It. It's somewhere that I heard, but it, it's like the, um, <laughs> he's like, I create, have you heard of this? I created it. I, I, I made wondered, it. You wondered if you heard of it. It's, it's world famous, but oh, you don't know? <laughs> no, no. It's, so I'll, I'll explain it like this. You know, like on those nature shows where, you know, somewhere in Africa, there's about 8 million wildebeest on the, the river's edge, right? And they're going, oh, should I jump? Should I jump? There's a thousand crocodiles in the thing. It's that one wildebeest that goes first, right? And then what does that do? It allows oh. all the whole like right. floodgates of, of animals to go. Sure. So yeah. in talking about stuff like this and you talking about alcohol or us talking about anything and everything mm-hmm. in our marriage, we give listeners and you gave listeners the, the privilege to go second. Like, oh, wait a minute. Ryan struggled with this? Or like Seth and Melanie, he's a therapist. What? They're talking about this? Oh man, so that normalizes it. That mm-hmm. gives them permission to be like, Phew, okay, I can talk about this too because you went first, right? So you're giving like the power of going second. And I think that more guys, especially guys in, in our space, need to see the value in that because just you saying what you did and talking about the things that you talk about and us too, it gives, it normalizes this thing that every marriage goes through, every person goes through, no matter what it is, alcohol or addiction or who knows what, mm-hmm. communication, it, it gives them permission to be like, oh, I'm not messed up. I'm, I'm not just a huge douchebag. Okay, I, they do it too. So it get, then, then you start the conversation, you know, like that. And I, I love doing that. Like you said, or somebody said, maybe it was you, like we, we do the podcast to help, of course, but also to grow because mm-hmm. like, you know, some of my favorite times yeah. of the week yeah. is when you, her and I like have, you know, a couple of hours dedicated to simply conversations, mm-hmm. interviewing people like you and being like getting real. It's like, oh, hanging out with my best friend, talking about real stuff. This is awesome. Right. So it's also, it's also for us mm-hmm. too. But since, since you shared what you shared, talk a little bit about like how you've grown or, or, or some of the, the positive things, you know, have dudes been like, Ryan, me too, man. Thank you for going. Thank you for sharing this. Oh yeah. So when I, so when I talked about being an alcoholic and I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant with that word. I, 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 don't, I, know I don't like it either. Yeah. It, it's at some point people begin to wrap up their identity in it. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that's healthy. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I don't consider myself an alcoholic. I, feel like if I, if I'm to describe it, that I'm susceptible maybe more than other people Mm -hmm. to alcohol. Mm -hmm. It's more tempting. Uh, if I have a drink, I want all of the drinks. Mm -hmm. Um, it's the way my body responds to it. So there are things that I agree are different than maybe somebody else, but I'm not going to wrap up my identity in being an alcoholic, just that I am prone and susceptible Mm -hmm. to being an alcoholic, to behaving that way, to making those choices. Mm -hmm. Um, all right. So back to what I was saying, uh, when I first started to share this, the first thing I did is I shared it in our iron council, which is our exclusive Mm -hmm. brotherhood. We've got about 1200 or so members Mm -hmm. in the iron council. And uh, again, you know, these are guys that look up to me. These are guys that respect me. These are guys that think I have everything figured out. I hope I've never communicated it that I, that I have everything figured out. I think I've been pretty honest about that with the exception of, of hiding this, this alcoholism. Um, yeah, so I shared it there first and the support was overwhelmingly positive. I mean, so much support from these guys and we have a sobriety channel Mm. in, in our, in our brotherhood and that thing blew up Mm -hmm. when I, when I shared and when I joined that channel, Mm. it blew up because like you said, it gave people permission to acknowledge their own demons and their own struggles and their own issues that they'd been hiding for years and years, just like me. Mm. So that was the Iron Council. And then a couple of months later, this was in, within the last week or two, I, I shared uh, you know, publicly through through my Instagram page. And again, I was nervous, you know, I, I was literally shaking as I typed this message out, and I was like, literally, my hands were shaking. Mm. 
I'm like, do I send this? Do I not? Do I save it as a draft? Do I delete it? Like, what do I do? Well, just hit send. And so I just punch send mm-hmm. or submit or whatever it is. And, and I just decided, okay, I'm just gonna let the chips fall where they may. And I have countless, countless messages, emails, I mean, people that have my phone number that I don't even know who, how they got my phone number, text messages, emails, direct messages from guys that are like, Hey, I really appreciate you sharing that. I've been struggling with this too. And I realize I need help and I haven't been forthright about it. Or I realize that my family's at risk. And so, yeah, it's been good for them. You know, it's, I, I hope that's been the case. And for me to be more public about it has a level of accountability mm-hmm. and, and, and because people know, mm-hmm. you know, I, I can't go back to those patterns because there's that, that public accountability, which has been admittedly helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, that support is like, okay, we can't do stuff alone. If we could, we would have done it by now, mm-hmm. you know? So having a, a brotherhood in place or a mastermind group or like a, a church group or something like that outside support mm-hmm. who get it. It's like, yeah, okay. You guys get it. You know, like no BS here. That is so, so important. Mm-hmm. It's basically like the power of community. Right. Right. So I want to ask you one thing. Um, so I have struggled with using alcohol as a coping. I mean, I guess that sounds like a therapist. I struggle with drinking too damn much. Right. <laughs> that's not a, yeah. that's not a therapist way to put it. Yeah. Right. And like, have really thought about it. Like, what is this? Am I like, an alcoholic. I don't like that term. I even went to, so I'm a licensed therapist, right? And also did like um, a long stint of actually studying substance use disorder to be a a drug and alcohol counselor too. And this was like one of the most stressful times. This was only like four years ago. I was literally gone back to school to study this and then leaving the parking lot, stopping at the gas station of the college, grabbing a six pack on the way home and like drinking one in the driveway. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, what, what the yeah. F am I doing? What, what is this? And I see like the devastation of like clients who are like chronically alcohol and liver damage and all this stuff. I'm like, what is this? And I, it was really hard to put together the pieces. And I went to a therapist for it and he asked me just a magic question. One that I've asked my clients hundreds of times, but he asked me and it just hit different. He was like, Hey, what would it, what would your life look like without alcohol? And I don't know why that question just blew me away. I was like, I have no idea. What would it? I mean, like parties, the weekend, cutting grass, doing some chopping wood. Well, I don't know. What would it look like without a beer? It would suck. It'd be boring. But that's, that's, the, that's the lie of it, right? And um, like just feeling the, 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 the turmoil of like, what, what is going on? So anyway, went, that, went through that, stopped drinking. And I... So when I stopped drinking for the first time, I started chewing tobacco like crazy. Just like, and they say that they do that. Like, you know, you see the guys at AA meetings, you know, they're just like chain smoking cigarettes like crazy or drinking gallons of coffee. And it's like, usually yeah. we, we erase something and replace it with something else. Hopefully you, you replace it with something healthy. Chewing tobacco, obviously terrible for you. So quit that too. But in, <laughs> in, in your process, what have you replaced it with? A lot of dudes like, you know, Redo 75 hard or jujitsu. I know you do these things. What did you find? Like, okay, I'm not going to do this and replace it with something healthier. What was that for you? Yeah, I'll answer that question. One thing that I do want to answer another question I think is in there as well, or something, a topic that needs to be addressed Mm -hmm. is when I started thinking about why I was drinking alcohol, the first response is I like getting drunk Mm -hmm. and I do. Mm -hmm. I I like getting drunk. I like, but, but why, like, what is it about it? Mm -hmm. You know, why, why? And I realized for me, it was a temporary reprieve, you know, it was, it was, and I'm like, well, from what? Mm -hmm. Like, I actually like my life. Mm -hmm. I love my wife. I love my kids. I love what I do. What in the world do I need a break from? And for me, it was just always being on. I just felt like my mind doesn't ever shut off. It's always thinking about the bigger, the better, the next, the, how to grow the business how to do this thing, how to make this. And I just, I just couldn't shut it off. And when I drank, I could, and I was, I was more relaxed. I was stress free. Mm -hmm. And, and I liked that. I actually convinced myself that I could, I I was podcasting drunk Mm -hmm. and I could, I convinced myself that I was a better podcaster when I was drunk because I was more loose. I was, I I was more creative or something. I don't know what I was saying to myself, Mm -hmm. but I convinced myself that's what I should be doing. 
So I think it is important that it's it's more than just getting drunk. There's something else there. And I think it's really important that we uncover that. What Okay, so what have I replaced it with? Well, I'll tell you what, I've recaptured about four plus hours of every single day of my life. Mm. I hate to say that because that sounds so pathetic, knowing that I was spending four or five hours a day getting drunk, already drunk, or passed out. Mm -hmm. And that was the reality. And when I stopped drinking, my energy level shot through the roof. Yeah. And I was like bored all the time. I'm like, what? why? Well, because I have, I just doubled, you know, my work day yeah. and I was so productive. I was getting everything done around the house, stuff with the business, bunch of emails that have fallen through the cracks, finances that had fallen through the cracks, things I wasn't even aware of, got back on top of. And now that that, all that stuff's, I'm on top of that stuff. It's like, Okay, well now, like, what what do I do now? Mm -hmm. So it has been actively with jujitsu. I spent a lot more time lifting than I have in, in the past. I might put an hour and a half to two hours every single day in the gym lifting. I'll be listening to something, typically a podcast or even just music or or a book or something. And and I spend more time lifting. Um, I spend a lot more time doing Legos with my youngest son, mm -hmm. like every day, usually it seems like. Um, and if we don't do it every day, he'll call me out on it. Like, Hey dad, we didn't build yesterday. We need to build today. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just spending time with the family, having lunch, sitting down, actually having lunch and having a conversation with my wife or my kids at the table for lunch. Yeah, it's just I, I've tried to consume myself. I will admit that I probably drink too much Red Bull. Uh, I, I, I'd like to cut back on that, but mm. that is a drink that has replaced the alcohol. Yeah. Um, hey, but you uh, know, other than that, I try to replace it with productive things. Uh, carbonated sodas, just like the carbonated yeah. water, you know, like lime flavored, whatever. Or kombucha. Or, well, yeah, or, or kombucha. If but I drank Red Bull, all I would do is yeah. sweat. Like I would just sweat. Yeah, you would. Armpit uh, sweat. <laughs> You know uh, what I mean? Uh, what, what was uh, that? Well, I, I want to ask something. a question. I want to ask a like, hard right turn here or left, whatever. Uh, how does faith play into all of this journey? I, I want to like get to the faith topic. Um, and, and I would love to know what that looks like for you. I'm probably not the best person to talk with about this because I don't, I have faith in God, you know, and I, I, but I don't really, I haven't worked that out yet. Yeah. You know, I, um, it's almost like a, like a convenient Christian where it's like, yeah, right. I believe in God. And then you ask for like more information about it. You're like, yeah, I don't really know. <laughs> right. like, I don't, mm -hmm. right. I don't know what scripture reference. I don't know right. what that means. I don't know what the Trinity is. God, three separate beings, three distinct beings, the same. Per I don't know. Right. Like I, but, but I'm trying to get closer to God. Yeah. I'll say it that way. Mm -hmm. um, and I realized that there's a lot of strength that comes from, knowing that you're divine, mm -hmm. uh, knowing that you're made for you're you're designed and made for something special. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure that out, out that what that is. I'm trying to magnify the things that I think it currently is. Um, and also trying to be grateful for my own personal struggles, grateful to God mm -hmm. for presenting me with these very painful moments in time. Mm -hmm. I also realize, and this has been helpful, that I, I've, I've talked with a lot of people who have dealt with alcoholism like chronically for decades and decades. And I think for me, one thing that's been helpful is that the challenges that I'm currently going through, although are painful and agonizing at times, I know everything's going to be okay in the long run. Mm -hmm. Like I just, I know it is. I know this is a period in, in time. I don't know how long this period lasts. I don't know what part of God's plan this is, mm -hmm. um, but I have that eternal perspective mm -hmm. and that gives me hope and comfort. Yeah. yeah I love that. I was what? again, I no, I'm going to interrupt you. Mm. I was listening to your interview <laughs> with Granger and you were like, why would God ask us to worship him. Like, isn't that really narcissistic? And as I was listening yeah. to that, I was like, there's gotta be, so I'm a total like word nerd. Um, I was like, there's gotta be a different definition of the word worship that we are misconstruing. And so this is for you, Mr. Mickler. Okay. <laughs> yes. So I looked up Please in the old Testament, share. the Hebrew and the Greek, um, like definition of the word worship it's associated with service and work that was done in the temple. Right. So like hmm. this sounds, it's not music. It's not like, God, you're the best. Yeah. yeah. It's like, no, I'm building it. Like I'm 
putting stones here to make a temple, right? Service. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also it talks about that the authors of the Bible were going against like cult worship. So like we're worshiping a cow or a golden calf or a snake sure. or whatever. And so like culturally for that time, they use the language of what the, of what society was doing. And so that this one I love, they were like, you know, be, be a living sacrifice, like a living sacrifice. Like I'm alive. You're not killing me on an altar. I'm alive. And I worship God as a living sacrifice. So that was like the two of the things that came up to me or came up when I was listening to that. And then they also talk about, it's like obedience, service, ministry, um, like monetary gifts are a way of worshiping somebody. So like they, this art, there was an article as well that they were like, we've used, we take the word worship and we turn it into the wrong thing. We either mean, we either think it means singing in church, which that's yeah. a thing. That's like a thing. And it was in like one book of the Bible where they use that term for, you know, like singing or that it's like, you're just telling God he's awesome all the time and that's what you're doing. Yeah. Praising. Right? right. Yeah. But what I love when I sort of interpreted that and as I was listening to you guys talk about it is like, it's obedience. It's like God saying, listen, follow this, follow what I'm doing. It will help you have a better life because mm. you are divine. Mm. You Ryan have a purpose. And if you stay on this narrow path in obedience, which is worship, you will have that life that I've made for you to have. Like, I don't know. I just think it's so cool. And I got like super jazzed about it that and like is. did all this Googling. <laughs> That's awesome. I really appreciate you sharing that because it's a more active approach. I, I, I was hesitant to ask that question because I didn't want to come it to be as, as it was not a, meant to be a confrontational question. Right. I was actually genuinely curious as to why, because you think about uh, the Greek gods, for example, basically in, 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 in that th those stories yeah. Yeah. that we were created as entertainment, mm -hmm. right? Like we were, we were to, the humans were to entertain the gods. That's right. why we were created. And so it's like, okay, why did, so God has this amazing power to create humans and animals and planets and the solar systems. And he created it so that we could praise him about how great he is for creating <laughs> us. Like, I don't, that right. doesn't yeah. compute. So like, I like what you're saying. Yeah. Well, and again, I mean, that, I really, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I just wanted to bring it up because again, we're on this journey in our own rate, like relationship where we're like, how does this fit in? And like, why do we use all these dumb church words that don't even feel like they make sense to us? And so I mm. loved, I loved that you asked him that question that got me all fired up to look up all those definitions, awesome. because I think we, when we get it wrong, it's so subtle, but it can mess so much stuff up. You know, like just not yeah. understanding what one word means mm -hmm. or having a, a deeper understanding of what one word means. It, it, it helps me to think about like, okay, you have kids, we have kids as well. And like God, the father, right? So I'm a, I'm a dad, right? A father mm -hmm. to my kids, right? Did we have them to like, so they will, you know, so, tell us how worship great we are. us? <laughs> No, yeah. we, we had no, them because not. we, we like, we wanted, and if you figured out how to get them to do that, <laughs> right. <props. laughs> right. I'll tell you when I, yeah, we'll, when we we'll, figure we'll it spread out. that message for sure. Um, but we had them because we wanted, uh, to like delight in them and like serve them and love them and like train them and teach them. Right. And like, it's almost like, I, I really, I really like looking at God or, you know, religion or whatever, at least Christianity as like, Oh, wait a minute. I'm a father. God loves us so completely, just like I love our kids. And is it like, uh, it, it's not. Well, you want our kids to be obedient to you because you know, right. Because I know it's like, hey, don't run in the road. Right. You know, wash your ears, <laughs> we know, at least hand. once a <laughs> yeah. year, you know, or, or whatnot. And like mm -hmm. that, I know from experience that is better. And I want to teach them lovingly, mm -hmm. not like, hey, do this or I'm going to, you know. Clobber you. Clobber you or anything like that. Charlie Brown. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that I, I really like, well, how about this? It's been really helpful for me, and I was raised in the church, like in South Carolina. We were like big time. We served in the church for a long time. Then our church imploded, yeah. went away for it for like eight years. And like, what is God? What is this? And we're we're re God has called us back mm -hmm. in a way of like I can't deny this, right? And it's not in like weird, stupid, silly, churchy Christianese way or right. anything. It's like, oh man, I I I I have I run I ran from you, God, but. You're calling me back. Mm -hmm. And like, that is just so profound and powerful to me. So looking at it like that might be helpful to listeners. It's certainly helpful mm -hmm. for me. And for some reason, I don't know, it's divine, I guess. We read this verse at our wedding and it was like James 1. And it talks about... Um, Consider uh, it pure joy. My brothers, when you go through trials of all kinds, because you're like being refined in the fire. And once you're on the other side, you're better for mm -hmm. it. Exactly what we talked about at the top of the show. It's like, oh, growth comes in what? 
the discomfort, like, oh shit, this is so hard. But on the other side, you know, yeah. so that, that, and I, I read that just recently. I started reading the Bible again for like an eight year hiatus. I'm like, man, all this is so new. And this mm-hmm. makes, it makes so much sense to me in the, in the time period that I'm in. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's encouraging. Hopefully as our listeners, it is for me because I'm like, yeah. man, this is so underutilized. Uh, and I'm, I'm just kind of excited yeah. about it, which I don't know. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. Before we, I do. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I, well, I wanted to say something on that as you guys were talking, cause I think there's a common, there's a common thing that I hear from a lot of guys actually who are, who would consider themselves spiritual and they'll say, you know, God is great. And I, I, I believe in God and I have faith, but church is horrible. Mm-hmm. Like church, church is bad and my church is up in the mountains of this kind of thing. And I understand the sentiment and I've, I've experienced that to some degree, but I don't, but I, but I disagree with the sentiment. I, I think we need church. Mm -hmm. And I I think it's important that I share this because the analogy I would use is imagine that you play for a, a professional football team, the Patriots, you play for the Patriots, but you never go to practice. Mm. Like, are you really on the team? Like, don't go to practice. You don't know the plays. You don't know how to communicate with the other team, team members. You don't know what the design is. You don't like, you don't, are you really part of the team? Mm -hmm. I I don't know that you can be, you go to practice because that's where you learn the plays. That's how you build teamwork. Mm -hmm. That's how you build accountability. That's where the camaraderie is. That's what keeps you on the path when you want to deviate. Mm -hmm. And just like practice, you know, you're going to have some, some team members that, you know, maybe don't like, <laughs> mm-hmm. like they're going they're on your team, but you don't like them. You don't get along with them. So, you know what, what do you do? You find a way to deal with it because mm-hmm. they're on your team, right? Mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and not every practice is great. Some practice is good. And other practice feels like it was a waste of time. And some days you go and it's awesome. And, but you just keep going regardless. And, and I wish more men would, would take that to heart a little bit and mm-hmm. and maybe you have to do some searching and maybe you have to do some digging and maybe you have to try different congregations and different branches and all this kind of mm-hmm. stuff. But I think it is a crucial part of the journey. I really do. Yeah. At least it has yeah. been for me. Yeah. I love I, it. It's like saying like, Hey, I want to be a good man and do right and all this stuff, but I don't need to talk to any other dudes ever. Right. I don't need, I don't advice. need to mm-hmm. read anything yeah. ever. And I don't even have to have conversations or even think about it. Right. Hmm. But I'm, I'm going to be a kick-ass yeah. man in all ways. It's like, right. well, hold up. That, it doesn't work that way, right. right? Like name one other thing that it works that way. It's like, oh, I enrolled in college, but never go to classes right. and don't read in the books. Well, okay. You're not going to get the benefit of like the degree mm-hmm. or learning or anything yeah. like that. So, um, well, and I'll also tell you, even with, based on what we've been talking about, my, my drinking picked up as we stopped with our church attendance mm-hmm. through, and a lot of it was COVID related. And I'm not, placing it on COVID, but I think the response to COVID was, was, uh, well, satanic mm. to put it mildly. Yeah. Like I really do believe, and and we fell prey to that in a lot of, I fell prey to that mm-hmm. in yeah. a lot of ways. Yeah. And, and so it, it's not coincidental that, um, the increase in my drinking happened to, right. uh, reflect my lack of church attendance. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a good point. Awesome. We, um, I'm so thankful that you're sharing this, but we, I want to be aware of time. Yeah. Well, I just want to say one thing, like in, in, like you, you mentioned satanic, um, uh, uh, you know, Larry Hagner, dad edge, you know, him and I have been having a lot of conversations recently and he's been talking about spiritual warfare. And that's Mm -hmm. something I really believed in like back in the day and then just got away from is like, Oh, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Especially with like what you're doing, like you're, you're charging men to be like Mm -hmm. much more awesome than they are. Right. You're charging people to get on the team to get on the show up. And then, and then with like us, with like the marriage work, we're mm -hmm. in it to change lives and change marriages and change families of origin for kids and like Mm -hmm. not perpetuate the dumb stuff that we don't want anymore in marriages. Oh, what better like angle to be attacked from? Right. Oh, let's cause division right here. Mm -hmm. You know, let's mess up that. Oh, COVID, whatever. Okay. Now Seth drinks more or like Melanie, whatever's more. It's like, oh man. So we need to guard ourselves in that and being part of a church. And again, this isn't about going to church, go, go to church or not. Mm -hmm. That's your choice. But it's like the value of that is huge that a lot of guys don't talk about. So I want to be respectful of your time. Thank you, man, so much. It's always good to hang out with you. Please tell people where they can find your stuff or any other thoughts going on for you. Yeah, I'll tell you where they can find me in a second. Because you guys were talking about Granger. Mm-hmm. So 
one thing that we didn't hit on in the podcast that much was this concept of spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. And and him and I have had conversations, just personal conversations. Mm -hmm. And uh, I reached out to him about the time that I stopped drinking. And uh, I reached out to him because he's been a good friend and, and I knew he would have some good counsel for me. And so I reached out to him and he said, hey, man, when's your book come out? And I said, you know, it comes out the the end of September. And he's like, I knew it. I knew your book was coming out. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, what do you mean? He's like, I knew your book was coming out because you're in a spiritual battle right now. Mm-hmm. Satan does not want that book in the hands of men. Mm-hmm. He does not want you. He wants to undermine your credibility. He wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to you to succumb to alcoholism. He wants all of that for you so that your message isn't as impactful and powerful as it could be. Mm -hmm. He says, you're in a battle that you don't even know about, that you don't even see and you don't even recognize. And you're trying to take, he said, your wooden shield and your wooden sword into a battle with the spiritual, a cosmic enemy Mm -hmm. that has surrounded you and flanked you and you can't even see it. Wow. Mm -hmm. It was pretty powerful. Yeah, um, I got cold yeah, stuff. Yeah, I'll just share that. Yeah, like, that's uh, amazing. That, that is powerful. And um, what's what's the saying? It's like the, the best enemy um, makes you think that it's not even he's not even there or something right. like that. It's right. the, uh, the best right. lie the devil the devil ever told was to make you believe he isn't there. That's something right. Like that. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So, yeah. man, that's powerful. Yeah. Thank you for even sharing that. So, you got to go, but tell people where they can find all your stuff. Yeah, orderofman.com. Or since you're listening to a podcast, we've got our podcast, Order of Man. Um, or on Instagram, I'm pretty active over there at Ryan Mickler, and you'll find us through those three places. All right, man. Thank you so much. This will air. I don't know when, but I'll shoot you a message and let yeah. you know. So again, man, thank you for your time. Awesome. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. It's changing lives. So keep it up, thank buddy. You. We're praying for you. Thanks for what you guys are doing too. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah have man. a great rest of your day. All right, later. Bye. Thanks. All right, guys. We sincerely hope that you really, really got some stuff from that podcast. Um, kind of shed some new lights on stuff, which is really awesome. And please remember to go check out Ryan's book, Sovereignty. That's his first book. And he recently released a new book called The Masculinity Manifesto. And I've only heard amazing things about it. So go check that out. Go follow Order of Man. If you got any questions, of course, send them to hello at anatomyofus.com and we'll get on it. All right. All right. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to Anatomy of Us. This podcast is produced by my mom, Melanie Studley, and hosted by my dad, Seth Studley. Our show is edited and published by our producer, Reba Hansen, from Creative Media Support. Special thanks to our Patreon members that get an extra episode every week. Thanks for watching. Love you. Bye. Bye.